achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson, and I'm joined in studio today by my young six-month-old son, Lucas, who you might hear chiming in in the background, potentially, throughout the show. Now, on this show, I will be breaking down not one but two events. We have, the, on Friday, December 14th, the UFC on effects Sauteropolis versus Pearson event, which is also the finale for Tough Smashes. And then on the Saturday, the 15th, we have the Ultimate Fighter finale, Team Carwin versus Team Nelson. Four fights for the UFC on effects finals. Uh, main card, six for the Ultimate Fighter Finals, 10 altogether. All of the preliminaries will be on uh, kamikazeoverdrive.net, and I'm going to keep my predictions fairly short for this show so we get them all in. There's a couple pr predictions from the Tough Smashes card. I'm not prelims. I'm not going to do so because I don't have the time with so many fights uh, with this event. So I apologize in advance, but I'll be breaking down everything else. There's a ton of fights this weekend. My bet packs, I'm coming off a great show, UFC on FX, or Fox 5. I went 8-3, nailed big upsets, including Eve Edwards and Matt Brown. Had a great night, and I did say, even though Ben Henderson and Rafael Sunsau ruined, and, you know, the two guys cost me my night, Henderson in my $5 bet pack was my number one non-predicted winner pick, and Sunsau was number four. I was originally on a Sunsau, I made the change, my fault. But my bet packs were huge. Three parlays, a couple of props, winning betting information on everything, four to five confidence picks, four to five value picks hit. It was a good night overall, and there were lots of prizes being given out for this event. There will be three walkout wear prizes handed out to all of the uh, to the winners, people who purchased my bet packs. And what I'm doing for this bet pack series, I'm going to do one, I'm going to do the two $10 bet packs for each event, and I'm going to do one $20 bet pack that combines both bet packs. It'll also include the two $5 bet packs. So the non-predicted winners, the extended rankings, and I'm going to do two combined lists of my top five value picks for the entire weekend, top five confidence picks for the entire weekend, and my parlays, all for 20 bucks. So it's about $35 worth of information for 20 bucks. so consider buying it. I've got a ton of stuff to get into. You can always check out all of my sponsors, all the other predictions, and all the great stuff going on at KamikazeOverdrive.net. Thank you very much for, as always, tuning in. Let's get to my first prediction. We're going to kick things off in the UFC's middleweight division. It's Hector Lightning Lombard, 31-3-1 battles. Who's some matter? Tolkienho, Paul Harris, 23-4. Four and O, oh, and taking a look at what these guys bring to the cage, we're very familiar with both fighters. Uh, Paul Harris, the BJJ black belt, ten of his fourteen wins have come by submission, but he also has improved, uh, you know, improving his striking and shows a lot of kicks. That front kick he nailed Dan Miller with, but for the most part, he's a very dangerous grappler. Uh, four point one four takedowns per fight, forty six percent takedown completion rate. He was able to get Dan Henderson off his feet with a giant slam. Very impressive, very physically strong individual. He has those flash submission skills, loves to attack the legs. But what comes down with Paul Harris is he has to get a fighter in that position to attack and feel you know do well with his ground game because in fights where he, that don't end by submission he's only four and four which is certainly an area of concern he lost to Hendu because he couldn't get him down for a submission uh, Dan, uh, Nate Marquardt and Alan Belcher were able to stop him after after defending the submissions and certainly there's some mental issues there with Paul Harris you wonder where he's at exactly again we've seen him in the past Lombard is an undersized middleweight on the other side of the cage but here he's he's very physically strong here he's actually going to be slightly bigger than Paul Harris which certainly will come into effect uh, Hector is an Olympic caliber judo c practitioner for Dan Judo black belt uh and he's a BJJ black belt so very capable on the ground all of his losses have come by decision very tough to, to, to handle and he went 9-for-9 nine nine defending Tim Boach's takedowns in this fight. I think that's what this comes down to. He needs to keep the fight standing. He needs to not go after takedowns. He needs to not give players a chance to set up his submissions. He's used that judo in reverse if you want to. And judo's proven very, you know, judo practitioners have been proven very difficult to take off their feet. Uh, he fought hurt against, hurt against Tim Boach. He did not have a good showing. And I, I hope, he, you know, I expect him to come out a lot more, you know, motivated. He's a heavily muscled individual, so he has to pace himself to avoid conditioning issues. And when it comes right down to it, I like what he's capable of. And he does a nice job of punishing his opponent when they shoot in for takedowns. And I think Paul Harris is going to struggle to get him to the ground, and he's going to eat some shots and maybe freeze up like we've seen him do in the past. So my prediction is, is Hector Lombard to defeat Husamir Paul Harris by TKO. Our next prediction is the Tough Smashes lightweight tournament final as Colin Freak Show Fletcher 8 1 0 battles Stormont Norman Park 16 2 0. Taking a look at what these two guys are capable of. Uh, Fletcher's one thing, the first thing that stands out to me is Colin Fletcher's going to have a huge size advantage 8 inches of reach and 5 inches of bite. He's a massive. Uh, lightweight when it comes right down to it. Very tall, very lanky. Uh, comparing their win totals, Park, 12 wins by sub. Fletcher, 7 win by, 
seven wins by submission as well. So we both know we know what they're both capable of on the mat. On the show, Park used two decision wins to get to the finals. Fletcher had a decision win and a submission win to get himself there. Very impressive. I think it was a key lock in the semifinals. I really thought that was great. Colin Fletcher probably the big, the most big show experience. He's fought in Bama twice and he has a two and zero record, which is fairly impressive. Uh, he comes into this fight with a four fight winning streak. Park six wins on his on O sides or on his side. Both guys have fairly basic striking skills. Again, I really like Fletcher's length. And I think that'll give him an advantage. Uh, Park tends to run forward with his punches, and he does use a lot of kicks, but I, I'm not a big fan of the way he charges forward with his head down, throwing punches. Like I said Fletcher will use a lot of kicks, knees, and spinning attacks, and he seems a little bit too tentative on his feet, maybe calm, maybe relaxed. It's kind of surprising how, you know reserved he is when he attacks. I really like Bo uh, Park's body lock takedowns. He's, he's very good with the scrambles, but Fletcher has very nice reversals. He's hard to control with his long limbs, and he has a tendency to rely on his opponents for the takedowns. I like Park in the fact that he should have a slight wrestling advantage, but I really think Fletcher's size and length will play a big role, both in the striking and when this fight goes to the ground eventually. I think he'll, you know, he'll eventually be able to set up a submission on Park and give him some trouble. So my prediction is Colin Fletcher to defeat Norman Park by submission. Moving right along, we're in the Tough Smashes welterweight final as Robert Whitaker... 9-2-0 uh, representing Australia, battles 8-1-0 Brad Scott representing the UK, and taking a look at these two individuals, uh, coming into this fight, Whitaker over his career, four wins by knockout and five wins by sub, he has two first round knockouts on the show to get him into the finals, while Scott, five wins by knockout and three wins by submission, he has a pair of decisions to get himself here, uh, Whitaker's over in his pro career is coming off a loss, He's got he's, and he's lost two of his last four fights, while Brad Scott has won six in a row. Now both guys are strikers with some ground skills, certainly. Uh, looking back at how they performed in the semifinals, Scott did get dropped in round two after winning basically round one and round three. I was actually really impressed with the way he moved. He has nice combinations. He, like I said, he moves very well. Excellent footwork. Changes levels effectively. Now Whitaker, when he knocked out Xavier Lucas in the semifinals, he barely touched him and put him away. So it shows what kind of power he has in his hands or what he's capable of if he's able to connect. Uh, he will attack with kicks and he works in the clinch well. Physically speaking, Scott will have some advantage just two inches of height and three and a half inches of reach, which could show up if this fight remains standing. I expect this to be actually a very close, very competitive fight. And again, I really like the way Scott moved and was a little concerned with how Whitaker was dealing with Xavier Lucas, uh, his Lucas's striking offense before the official knock. And I didn't like the fact he seemed a little tentative. And it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. Both guys are finishers, but I'm actually going to go with the decision in this fight. I think it goes the distance. I'll take Brad Scott to defeat Robert Whitaker by decision. In our UFC on FX6 main event, the coaches will go at it as Australia's George Sotteropoulos, 14-4-0, battles Ross the Real Deal Pearson of the UK, coming in with a record of 15-6-0. Now, taking a look what these guys are capable of, Sotteropoulos, the interesting for him, this is his first fight in 17 months, he's had a long layoff based on the fact he's been injured, and of course the ultimate fighter taking time off to coach there. Now Ross Pearson on the other hand, he's returning to lightweight for this fight after dropping to featherweight and going with a 1-on-1 -on -one record. I believe he will go back to 145 pounds after this fight is over. Now, this is your traditional striker versus grappler matchup. Uh, George Sotteropoulos is a BJJ black belt and eight wins by submission, including tapping out guys like Joe Lozon and George Roop. Now Pearson on the other hand, he's a, he's a brawler slash striker, but actually when you look at his win totals, he has more submission wins than anything else. He's a black belt in Taekwondo and a brown belt in Judo, and that could come into effect in this fight. Now, Sotteropoulos on the same thing. He has an amateur boxing background, though so certainly capable of handling himself on the feet, but he did get rocked and outstruck by Dennis Seaver, and he got knocked out by Rafael Dos Anjos in his uh, last appearance. Now, uh, for the ground, Sotteropoulos averages 2.67 takedowns per fight, but only completing 37% of his attempts, and that's very crucial to his success in this matchup, is the ability to get the fight to the ground. Pearson, on the other hand, 79% takedown defense, very impressive. Uh, he did a nice job when Junior Asuncao took him down in his featherweight debut. He did go down a, uh, th three times in that fight, but was able to get back up every time very quickly before Asuncao can mount any offense. Uh, Pearson has a lot of moves in his feet, does a nice job moving in and out. He will attack with power, but when it comes right down to it, he needs to limit his mistakes. Uh, striking totals, he averages 4.19 strikes per uh, 15 minute or per minute, compared to only 2.41 for for uh, Sotteropoulos, which is a huge advantage for every second he keeps his fight standing when he wants to score points. As I said, Sotteropoulos needs to get in and score takedowns, and that's what it really comes down to. Now, Pearson has been submitted twice in his career. The first count one came in his pro uh, pro career, and the second was by Cole Miller after getting dropped on the feet. He got hurt badly before Miller was able to take him down and submit him. A couple big questions looking at this Sotteropoulos' age. It has to be catching up with him. His speed is a big issue in this fight, and certainly ring rust. Uh, will play a factor with a 17-month layoff, but at the same time, he's fighting at home, and that'll be a huge boost 
uh, for Sotteropoulos. He didn't have a lot of success. I believe he fought Seaver the last time he was at home and, of course, lost that fight. Now, one thing to take into consideration is Sotteropoulos was creeping up into contention. Of his seven UFC wins, only one of those guys is still in the lightweight division, which is Joe Lozon. And the other guy he beat, George Roop, has now dropped all the way down to 135 pounds. Not to discredit Sotteropoulos, but to certainly put things in perspective. I think there are too many questions surrounding the Australian uh, with his layoff and age. And really, he has to get this fight to the ground consistently for the win or submit Pearson, which could be very difficult. I expect Pearson will outwork him and use a lot of movement. I, it's a five-round fight. Pearson could stop him, but most likely this is going the distance. So my prediction is Ross Pearson defeat George Sotteropoulos by decision. Now we move over to the Ultimate Fighter 16 finale, and the opening fight I'm going to predict actually was originally on the main card. It's been bumped to the preliminaries, but I'm going to stick with it on here anyway because this is how I'm set up to predict it. Uh, we are in the UFC's welterweight division. Is Mike Quicksand Pile 23-8-1 battles 9-2-0 James head. And again, I'm trying to go through these as quickly as possible since there are a lot. Uh, now, Pyle has really come to his own of ladies. won five of his last six, which is quite impressive. Now, James had 2-0 and since cutting down from middleweight to welterweight. And he, certainly, he's a gigantic welterweight. He had enjoyed a nice size advantage over bro both Brian Ebersol and Pappy Abetti in his first two fights. But against Mike Pyle, Pyle's a very big welterweight as well and should be able to match up physically very nicely with head. Uh, Mike is a veteran uh, on the mat with a serious ground game. BJJ brown belt, which is very impressive. 2.01 takedowns per fight. He dominated John Hathaway on the ground, controlled from, uh, near on the mat when he got him there. And he's the only person in the UFC so far to take Rory McDonald off of his feet. Uh, I can't remember if BJ Penn the other night actually scored an official takedown, but either way, uh, Pyle actually was able to take him down. And he said he, was, he used a single leg on Rory, which was quite impressive, and he was successful controlling him for a good duration of the opening minutes of that fight. Uh, he has a very good top game. Smothers will posture up. He look with big shots, and he'll, he's always looking for submissions. On the other side of things, James has a BJJ purple belt, and he does have three wins by submission, so he's not, by no stretch of the imagination, is he a novice on the mat. Uh, he showed an excellent sprawl against Ebersol, uh, but he was taken out eventually and had trouble trouble on his back and against in his uh, UFC loss to Nick Ring he, uh, went five for Nick Ring went five for five in his takedown attempts and he really and he was also taken down by Pappy Abetti and controlled early on in that matchup so that does not bode well for him against a guy like Mike Pyle now st standing head has nice straight punches he will use the clinch and knees but he's a little hesitant against Abersol and again I think that was due to the takedown threat and I expect that to show up in this fight as well now Pyle is improving his striking certainly he has a lot of movements Nice straight right when he hurt Ricardo Funch and when he stopped uh, near as well. That was very impressive. He also will tie up and use the clinch and knees. Uh, now, against uh, near, he was getting beat up along the cage, which was certainly a concern before landing that big knockout blow. Now, Pyle's recent losses came when he was overwhelmed on the ground by strikes from both Rory McDonald and Jake Ellenberger, and that's something to keep in mind here. But I don't see James Head being the type of guy who's going to be able to get Pyle to the ground and dominate him in that sense. I think. Uh, Pyle's ground game and top control will be the major difference in this fight, and my prediction is Mike Pyle to defeat James Head by decision. Our next prediction is the UFC's featherweight division as Dustin the Diamond Poirier, 12-2-0, battles Ultimate Fighter uh, champion Jonathan Brookins, 14-5-0. Uh, now, looking at Jonathan Brookins first, this guy has faced some of the best featherweights in the world. He fought Jose Aldo. Many people don't know that. He fought him back in the WEC. Eric Koch, Charles Oliveira, and now Poirier. Now, unfortunately for him, he's 0-3 in his first three matchups. Looking to turn that around here. Eight of Brookins' wins have come by submission, but he's been working diligently to improve his striking, and it's cer certainly showing up. But when it comes right down to it, he still needs to complete his takedowns to be effective. In those three losses I already mentioned, he was 3 for 25 in takedowns. Uh, and against uh, Michael Johnson, the Ultimate Fighter finale, he didn't have success until Johnson and started to tire, and he was able to get hit the fight to the ground and dictate things. He has a nice single leg, but he really has that impressive lateral drop, and if he can hit that, that's a, certainly a big advantage for Brookins. Unfortunately for him, he, you know, he only completes 18% of his takedown attempts. That had a lot to do with his un, un, uh, inability to get Eric Koch to the ground in that matchup. 2.01 takedowns per fight uh, per 15 minutes when he is able to complete takedowns. Uh, like I said, he struggled to uh, complete attempts against Coke. He did pin him on the cage for long durations in that fight, but had limited success landing any form of offense, and Coke won that matchup based on his striking and grappling defense. Now, Dustin Poirier, 65% takedown defense, but uh, the Korean Zombie was able to take him, off on his, uh, take him off his feet four times on four attempts, which is pretty impressive. 
And one thing Poirier kept getting his leg caught every time he kicked. So that's something you have to watch out against Brookens. He cannot leave openings if he wants to keep this fight standing, or at least not give Brookens an opportunity to get his game going. Now, Poirier has relied in the past on his grappling if his striking is going bad, uh, but Brookens himself is a 67% takedown defense, which is very impressive in his own right and ability to keep the fight where he wants it to remain, or at least keep you know give himself an opening to get on top. Uh, I think on the feet, Poirier will have a significant advantage. He lands 3.95 strikes per minute compared to only 2.4 for Brookens, which shows up huge in a 15-minute fight. Uh, and at the same time, Brookens takes a lot of damage. He gets hit 3.24 times per minute compared to Poye, who's just under 3. I know that's not a big... Uh, separation, but again, you take into consideration their offensive outputs, and you'll see the numbers add up. And now another thing with Jonathan Brookens I want to touch upon quickly is he has that big hair, and one thing I don't like with fighters is when they have that big hair and you get hit, it seems to magnify what the, the hit actually looks like, because the judges see that hair whipping around, and it looks like the hit was more significant than it was, and I think that actually shows up when the judges are looking at the impact of his opponent's offense. Now, one thing, Brookens has a tendency to hold his chin up very high, and he was also dropping his hands versus Oliveira, and he got rock, rocked by a big right hand. All things you don't want to do against a guy like Poye, who has the capability of stopping you on the feet. Now, as I said, Poirier needs to rely on his technical boxing, mix in his kicks, and step knees, which he does very well, and simply outwork Brookens on the feet. Now, Brookens, as I said, has shown improvement, but still has a glaring, glaring holes in his striking defense, and he tends to get wild when attacking, which can create more openings for his opponent to capitalize on. Poirier really has a decent submission game, but I think he'll keep the fight where his greatest advantage is, and my prediction is Dustin Poirier to defeat Jonathan Brookens by TKO. Moving right along, we're in the UFC's lightweight division for a fight I think is going to be the best one of the whole weekend, or has the potential to be one of the best of the weekend as Melvin the Young Assassin Gallard 47 12 and 3 with one no contest takes on 27 and 1 with two no contests Jamie Varner now Two veteran fighters of the sport. And you look at Jamie Varner, Varner first. He has a nice split of wins. Nine wins by knockout, nine wins by submission. Compared to Melvin Gillard, who has that big knockout total of 19. But he's only tapped two guys out in his career. And people take that into perspective. Continuing along that lines, Gillard has been tapped out nine times in his career. Six times inside the octagon. And again, that's a huge disadvantage when fighters with submission capabilities are preparing for Melvin Gillard. They know he has that glaring weakness. Now, Melvin has very good speed, excellent speed, one of the fastest guys in the division, big-time power and good footwork, but again, you look at that Fabricio Camoy's fight, he was slowed significantly by the simply, simple threat of a takedown. Looking at Jamie Varner, he has an excellent power double, NCAA Division One wrestler, he will use takedowns effectively in his fights. Going back to that first time he fought Donald Cerrone, who's a very you know, good submission fighter, uh, he took Cerrone down nine times back in the first matchup in the WEC. Now, looking at Varner on the feet, he's no slouch either, he showed a lot of movement and good hands versus Joe Lozon. He has that big right pow hand that's very dangerous. He does a nice job attacking the body. Heavy leg kicks and body kicks, which will really show up. Uh, he throws in some nice elbow strikes, and he fought at a high pace against Lozon and slowed down, but also consider the fact he took that fight on uh, late notice, so his conditioning won't be up to par. This is the first fight in the UFC he's actually fought in this recent stretch, where he will have had a full training camp and prepared for this matchup, knowing who he was going to fight, barring an injury in the next week. Let's hope not. Uh, against Edson Barbosa, he landed a nice body shot and then came over the top of the right hand and continued to work that formula and eventually hurt Barboza and, and put him on the ground after, uh, finished him after the fight going to the mat. Uh, against Lozon, he also hurt him several times. Now, he got clipped and got hurt, and that's something to consider with J uh, Melvin Gillard, because Gillard has so much power, he might only need one opportunity to put Varner away if he's able to label him. Uh, now, against Lozon, again, going back with Varner, he did take him down a couple of times, but he was concerned with the ground game, and Melvin Gillard is very familiar with that, as he got hurt by uh, Lozon and submitted in very quick fashion when they fought. Another thing to consider with Jamie Varner, he caught the Barboza kick for a takedown in green top position, and that's something Melvin Gillard has to be very, very capable or careful of because if this fight goes to the ground, he could be in significant trouble. Looking back at Gillard's matchup with Jim Miller, he was beating Miller to the punch every time, doing very well with the striking. Uh, un unfortunately, he got way too aggressive, and it led to a takedown, and Miller was able to, to capitalize on the submission areas, areas in that fight. Uh, again, going back to the Kamoy's fight as well, uh, Fabrizio had him in multiple bad positions. It simply was unable to capitalize on it. It took everything Gillard had to get out of those situations, and you don't want to give guys with strong wrestling uh, capabilities a top position. Uh, when Gillard fought Donald Cerrone, he dropped them with a counter right hand and swarmed on, which was very impressive because Cerrone is a very tough guy to stop. Uh, but the thing is with Gillard, he did get knocked out in that fight, and he's coming off his first career knockout, so you have to keep in mind how is that going to affect him. Uh, striking defense, Melvin's a tough guy to hit 70% striking defense, but... Uh, 
I think the key to this matchup will be the ground game. Melvin's 69% takedown defense, which is very impressive, but look at Jamie Varner. He averages 3.66 takedowns per fight, 53% takedown defense, and I think that shows up here. Gallard, I'm not sure mentally where he's at. The Lozon fight certainly messed with his head, and I think the Donald Cerrone one's going to as well. He's changed camps, left Greg Jackson's, had not nearly as much success as he, did, as he had when he was with Jackson. And uh, I really think he's going to make a mistake here and it's going to lead to a bad position. He has a submission weakness. I'm starting to question his chin a, a little bit. He's taken a lot of damage over his career, and I think there are some openings there. And I think my predict and Jamie Varner will capitalize on them. And my prediction is Jamie Varner to defeat Melvin Gillard by submission. We're now in the UFC's heavyweight division as Pat HD, Barry 75 and 0, battles former Strike Force competitor 11 1 0, Shane Del Rosario. Now, looking at Del Rosario first, he looked very good in the Steve Mayochik fight in his debut until he slowed down. But take into consideration, please, it was his official debut in the octagon. It was his first fight in roughly 15 months. He was coming off a tremendous injury, so certainly that played a role in that performance. Now, both fighters have striking backgrounds. Kick, uh, Barry had an 18-6-1 kickboxing record, and Del Rosario 8-1-0. Uh, now, Del Rosario was a two-time WBC Muay Thai champ, and Bat Barry competed multiple times in uh, K-1 competitions, so certainly guys can handle themselves on the feet. Barry comes in with six of seven wins by knockout, including uh, Christian Moorcraft, Anthony Hardonk and Dan Evanson. Del Rosario, eight of his 11 wins have come by knockout as well. Now, Pat Barry has been KO knocked out twice in his last four fights uh, by Czech Congo and LeVar Johnson. So you have to start wondering if his chin is starting to catch up with him and maybe his fight IQ is certainly putting himself in some bad positions. Now, Del Rosario, as I said, he's coming off his first career loss. It was a TKO on the ground. Some fighters certainly respond well. It'll be interesting to see how he responds coming into this matchup. But in that fight, as I said, he did very well early on. He was eating Myochik up with some heavy body and leg kicks. And I think he hurt him several times. That's something to keep uh, in mind. And Barry has some brutal leg kicks as well, especially the low kicks. And he'll go high, and he's very dangerous in that sense. Now, looking at physically how these fighters match up, Del Rosario is going to have some significant size advantages. Six foot four to Barry's five eleven. He's going to have three and a half inches of reach. I think those will show up in the striking uh, matchups. But Barry has faced multiple guys that are bigger than him uh, when he's fighting as an undersized heavyweight. Both guys spent some time at Death Clutch, so that's something to take into consideration as well. They could have some familiarity there. Now, one thing Barry is working to improve his ground game. He showed better defense against Christian Moorcraft and better offense against Le LeVar Johnson, but he still struggles. Uh, Struve caught him in a nice triangle. Tim Hag subbed him early in his career, and Mirko Krokop was able to tap him out with a rear naked choke without even using the hooks. Now, Del Rosario, people, my people might not know this, he's a BJJ blue belt, and three of, uh, he has three wins by submission, and two of those have come in the last three, his three victories. He tapped out LeVar Johnson back in strike force with an arm bar, and simply put, he saw LeVar's weakness on the ground, and he exploited it, and that tells me he's a very intelligent fighter. As I said, Barry has defensive gra grappling problems, and his chin might be getting worse. I think Shane Del Rosario has the ability to hang with, and maybe even get the better of Barry standing, and attack him on the ground as well. He simply has more dimensions. I think Barry should make a move to light heavyweight after this fight if he's still with the promotion. But either way, my prediction is Shane Del Rosario to defeat Pat Barry by submission. For the co-main event of the evening, we are in the Ultimate Fighter 16 Tournament Finals in the UFC's welterweight division as 5-1-0 Colton Smith battles 8-2-0 Mike the Martian Ricci. Now, looking at this fight, uh, Ricci's going to have a significant experience advantage. He has a number, more, he has a few more pro fights than Colton Smith, and that's something, you know, with young guys, certainly plays a role. Now, Colton did have one appearance for M1 prior to this, and Ricci fought for Bellator, so both guys have fought on the bigger stage against better competition. Looking at Mike Ricci, his only pro losses are against Pat Curran, the featherweight champion in Bellator, and Darren Cruikshank, who we just saw in the last box card. So two very talented guys are the only two guys that have been able to shut Ricci down in his career so far. Colton Smith, in his last pro fight, he's coming off a knockout defeat, which has sought me to take into consideration. All three of his pro wins before the show came by submission, so we know what he's all about. He has a grappling-heavy attack. All three of his wins have come by grappling-based decisions, where he basically gets, you know, gets his opponent down to the ground. He showed very limited striking. He might be one of the poor. He's a poorer striker. I'm not very impressed with his top or with his stand-up skills. He does he, effectively, though. He pushes his opponent into the cage, and he will look for takedowns. He has good top control. Once he gets the fight there, he smothers them effectively. He does look to advance his position, but he doesn't do a ton of ground and pound. He's looking for submissions. He's looking for advantages and openings holes, but doesn't do a lot to break his opponent down. Now. In his last fight, he lost the final round of that matchup in the semifinals when he couldn't get the fight to the ground and was forced to stand and trade with his opponent. Now, looking at Ricci, he's going to have four inch reach advantage, which is something to take into consideration. He has four wins by knockout, and he holds a pretty significant win over Jordan Meehan of Strike Force back in 2009, which you know tells me a lot about this guy. He has some brutal elbow strikes, and he nailed the one in the, no in the semifinals to score the knockout. 
Overall, he's a pretty decent striker. He mixes up his punches and kicks very effectively, and he will also look for takedowns as well. He showed very good top control against Hill and some nice ground and pound when they fought in the quarterfinals, I believe it was. Uh, he did, was effectively able to power out of a very bad position on the mat in that fight and went from being on the bottom to being on the top just you know, with brute strength and technique. It was very impressive. Simply put, Ricci needs to keep this fight standing. He has a significant advantage there, and take into consideration where this guy trains. It's out of the TriStar gym with his very close friends with Rory McDonald, uh, George St. Pierre obviously trains there, Francis Carmont, Rick Hahn, and the list goes on and on. He should be ready for the grappling of Colton Smith. He should have seen, been grappling with higher level grapplers than Smith. Should be able to keep this fight standing. And my prediction is Mike Ricci to defeat Colton Smith by knockout. In our main event prediction of the evening, Roy Big Country Nelson, 18-7-0, the one half of the coaches from the Ultimate Fighter, takes on Matt Mitrione, 5 0 subbing in for injured Shane Carwin. Now, Mitrione is coming off his first career defeat, and he's also coming off a significant layoff of 13 months, so it'll be interesting to see how he rebounds, and if there is ring rust, I expect there will be some. Now, Nelson's conditioning is certainly improved, but is it ready to go a five full ra five full rounds if it's required? That's a question we have yet to have answered. It should be answered. I, I, it could be answered on this night. Now, Mitrione, physically speaking, he He's going to have a huge reach advantage at nine inches, and that plays a role in the striking game, especially if Matt can dictate the pay or dictate the distance. Uh, and Matt's a very fast and agile, surprisingly fast and agile fighter for a heavyweight. He has excellent conditioning as well, or at least so far we've seen that as a former football player. It's not a shock there. Now against Czech Congo, when he lost that fight, he did an excellent job feinting and closing the distance, but simply put, he failed to engage Congo on a level that was able to give him, you know, enough points or enough damage to score and win rounds. Now uh, for Nelson, he has. Big time power in his right hand. He stopped Stephen Struve, Dave Herman, and Brendan Schaub in the tough finals. But Mitrione has a more diverse striking attack, and I really like his kicks. He's very successful with those kicks, and they can do a lot of damage chopping guys down. We saw it against Kimball. We saw it against Christian Moorcraft. Now, as I said, Matt Mitrione needs to stay on the outside, use his reach to keep Roy at bay, and move in and out, attack, and then retreat to avoid Roy's big power. Now, Nelson has started to use more takedowns in his re in his attack. He had a lot of success against Crow Cop with his ground game, and he's a BJJ black belt. And look at Matt Mitrion over his ten six UFC fights. He's been taken down on 10 occasions. Congo had success in that third round, putting him on his back, and he didn't have a lot of answers for him. Now, as I said, Matt Mitrion is a type of fighter who always improves every time out, and he's had such a long layoff. We could see some new stuff from him. He's been working with the Black Zillion camp. That's something else to look at as far as what new skills he might pick up and bring to the cage that we're not prepared for, not at least expecting. Now, as I said, Nelson has a lot of success has pinning guys along the cage. He did it to Frank Mir, is a very big and strong uh, heavyweight, and he does a nice job of closing that distance and dragging his opponent to the ground from that position. When Roy gets on top, he's very effective at using that body weight to smother his opponent. He will do damage with strikes, and that crucifix position is his real, a favorite. He really locks it up and can do that effectively. Now, I expect Mitrione to be a little bit hesitant to attack as he was with Congo for fear of that takedown, and he might not be as he uh, big, quick to pull the trigger with those kicks again, wanting to limit Roy's openings to take the fight to the mat. Now, Matt's chin is been tested but not with the type of power that Roy possesses and that's something to take you know a concern if Roy is able to land but one thing Nelson needs to do is avoid telegraphing his, his punches. He has a tendency to do that, and Mitrion should be able to slide out of the way if that does happen. Now, Nelson's advantage on the ground on the ground is significant, and his power is always a threat in this fight. Ring rust could be a problem for Mitrion as he took this fight on a little bit of short notice, and Nelson's conditioning at the same time could be an issue for him if this fight goes long, and I expect he's going to understand that and want to get it over with quickly. Now, no one in the UFC has been able to stop Nelson yet, and Mitrion doesn't have the skills to submit him on the ground. Now, Matt could win a decision, a five-round decision, if he's able to you know, outpoint him, but he will need to keep this fight standing early on to do it and then get the fight into the second half against Nelson. And simply put, I'm going to have to go with the more significant talent gap, and that is the ground game. Even if Nelson gets tired late, he should be able to secure the win early with his takedowns. And I'm actually going to take Roy Nelson to, to, TK, to score a TKO victory over Matt Mitchell, either hurting him on his feet and stopping him on the ground, or possibly getting him in that crucifix position, exploiting his weaknesses on the mat. Either way, Roy Nelson to defeat... Matt Mitrione by TKO. So those are my predictions for the two events. I know this is a long show, guys, so I'm going to keep this short. Ten fights I'm predicting in this uh, on this uh, episode. All of my preliminary predictions that I'm posting will be available over at KamikazeOverdrive.net. If you're betting on the events, please consider buying the bet packs. A lot of great information. The $20 bet pack, the deluxe bet pack, which will have both events included. We'll also have the two minor $5 bet packs included. And a lot of combined information, value, uh and confidence picks along with some parlay. So please take that into consideration. I came, I'm coming off an excellent show of UFC on Fox 5. I feel very good about these predictions. We only have one event left after this in 2012. It's UFC 155. Let's finish the year strong. As always, thank you very much for listening. Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions.